Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. For you who have this second edition of the big book, Bill's story is in that book. His story is, there's nothing the matter with me, as he sold his pair of shoes for two bottles of wine. And uh, without any further ado, I'm looking forward to hearing Bill. Bill, please. Now we come to Bill. <laughs> Boys and girls, this is a healthy looking bunch, I'll tell you that right now. And for a Friday night, we have a very fine representative gathering. I'm sure the building is what attracted you here. <laughs> Christ, this is better than the Rome Coliseum, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> You know, as I stand in front of you tonight, I'm deeply grateful for Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, and that the 20th anniversary of AA in St. Louis, I was privileged to be on the program, and I've never forgotten it that out of all of these tens of thousands, they would ask me to speak at an international convention. It's quite an honor, as it is to be here tonight. This is truly a fine representative gathering of AA at work. And in the years that have passed, I've continued to go to meetings, and be associated with AA in all of its ramifications. In the duties that one learns to perform, in the tasks that are allotted to you, and the chores that you do, and the 12-step work that is so important. I'd like to paint you a few word pictures of Bill the alcoholic, if I may. Hmm. <laughs> it's so good. I think that was Jackie Gleason's line. <laughs> and you can judge from what I say whether it has any meaning to you or not. This is just my opinion. This isn't AA's opinion. I only tell you of myself and what I did and how I drank. Why I drank, God in his wisdom only knows. I don't. Because as a young man, uh, we were privileged in the Green household to have a pitcher of beer on the table at every dinner. And as a young boy, I, uh, I never cared a hell of a lot for the flavor, but I sure enjoyed the effect it produced. And as time passed, it seems that I just gravitated to it a little more and more. And as a a 15-year-old kid, I was at the stage to where my parents thought I was in cars. I was stealing bicycles. I, we were opening letters out of mailboxes and all of that kid stuff, which I thought was very thrilling because the money came out of those envelopes in those days. They didn't have, they didn't write money orders or checks or anything. Everybody mailed cash. And I thought it was great when we could open a letter and see a five dollar bill float out of there. So they shipped me off to a military academy, a fine Catholic school, 
And I was privileged. No, I wasn't privileged. I was forced to stay there. <laughs> for some eight years. And uh, thank God for that, because I was reborn then. I really learned how to drink now. I, <laughs> before, I was just fooling around. You know, as a young man, I uh, <clears throat> I went into the furniture business. A more miserable business was never created in the retail furniture business. And it uh, seems everybody drinks that sells. Most all selling men are two-fisted drinkers. And I liked that. I didn't care a hell of a lot for the flavor, but I did enjoy the effect it produced. <laughs> oh! When I was half in the tank, I was a veritable tiger. I'd look at myself in the mirror and I'd say, Oh, Bill, you're magnificent. <laughs> Now, isn't that a terrible way to start out life as a young man? But I was <clears throat> fortunate to meet a lady that I married, and uh, we were very happy. We had two lovely children. It didn't interfere with my drinking, but it seemed somehow or another it interfered with my working. Uh, at this early age, I realized that working for someone else, I would never have any money, because he got it all. So, a friend of mine, a little Jewish fella, he and I got together and opened up a little store. And uh, I'm not drinking too much at this particular time because I was able to carry it and hold it and oh man business was good and we made money and I used to stand out in front of the store on Saturday night <clears throat> see in those days we were open seven days a week just like you are here and there's a fellow by the name of Charlie he came along one Saturday night and said to me, Bill, I'm glad you're here. You're just the fellow I want to see. I said, oh, yeah? I looked at him with a rather jaundiced eye because uh, I knew a little bit about him. He said, you and Wilma are coming over tonight for a rubber of bridge. Oh! God, what an insane suggestion. <laughs> well, I said, Charlie, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. And I, oh, yes, he says, it's all set. The girls got together this afternoon. and uh, That was auction bridge in those years. A more insidious, insipid game was never created for the mind of man. <laughs> And, you know, we always managed to get to Charlie's nine-ish, you know? And there on the table, next to the card table, sat a moldy martini. Oh, it had been sitting there since seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> but be very kind to it, because it's the only one you're going to get that night. <laughs> So I learned to stay away from Charlie at an early age. <laughs> and my drinking continued to increase, and I, uh, I discovered I was married to a miserable woman. <laughs> Isn't that so? <laughs> Why don't you be a man and drink like Charlie. What the hell, if I drank like Charlie, I'd never be where I am tonight. <laughs> <laughs> she
she hid this stuff in all sorts of spots that you can't all know about. And I decided that the only way that I could uh, do anything about this, I wouldn't drink at night. I'd get loaded and come home and have dinner and then go to bed. But I had a bartender friend of mine that I stopped in this particular morning and I had a burning urge. Oh, in the morning I needed a drink so bad I could taste it. And he made me a concoction. You poor kid, he said. I, I know just how you feel and I know he did. And he said, I'll fix you something that'll release it. Where do you hurt? I said, Jack, I hurt all over. Honest to God, I do. I'm so sick. Yes, he says, I know. And he went behind the bar and he fussed around in there. And he had a uh, white of an egg, a jigger of gin, and a dash of orange bitters. It is now... 10.30 in the morning. <clears throat> of course, my partner, I guess, is wondering what the hell happened to me. And I drank it. Oh, my God, was it good. Oh, my Jack, make me another. He says, I will. <laughs> and I said, you better make me another. He says, I'm glad to, my boy. Now, he says, you're set for the day. Well, I was sure set for the day, all right. I weaved in. Hello, buddy. How are you? He said, what the hell? Are you? What's the matter with you? Oh, I said I had to get a little medication. I, uh, <clears throat> I have a terrible throat. <laughs> yes, he says, I guess so. So from then on, I was a morning drinker. I had to have that booze in the morning. <clears throat> It got to the point to where I was drinking old overhold, I'll tell you that, as a young man. That was a hundred proof rye and mighty powerful. And I got so I would bring a pint into the store with me, you know, those little pints that in here, jacket. And we had two desks there. Bernie's was there and there was mine. Of course, the bankroll was in our pockets. And... Uh, <laughs> He looks over at me, he sees me slipping this pint in the desk. He says, what the hell are you bringing booze in here? I said, B, you don't understand. I mean, if a customer falls down or is take... <laughs> I mean, I've got to have something to revive him. <laughs> well, he became very suspicious of me. <laughs> and I said to him, what is this you've got on your desk there? There was something called a scratch sheet. <laughs> he played the horses. I see there's a few horse players here. And I looked at all of these figures, and it didn't make any sense to me. Oh, he said, I only bet a couple of bucks now. And then I became very suspicious of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, time passes rapidly when you're young and having fun. And me being thoroughly disgusted with my environment at home, uh, I thought I ought to leave. I didn't plan on telling anybody that I was going, but I thought I was going to leave. And so I went to Bay and I said, Bernie, uh, I think we ought to dissolve this partnership. I, I have a feeling that, uh, that uh, I want to go farther west. Oh, yeah? Well, he says, that's fine with me. I was aghast. The guy was glad I wanted to break it up. So we dissolved our partnership, and I decided not to tell the late Mrs. Green the situation. I loaded the car up, and away I went. Well, you know, I developed a nasty little habit over the years. When I'd get too much to drink, I'd have to throw up. <laughs> God, what a waste of booze. <laughs>
<laughs> so on the way west, I always managed to get, well, they didn't call them motels, and they called them cabins. Cabins, a buck a night with one bed, two dollars a night with two beds. And I always got one with twin beds. One to sleep in and one to throw up in. <laughs> see, see, I was a high type fellow. <laughs> and I just kept on going. And I went all the way out to the West Coast. And we're having our convention there next year in Seattle. And that's where I stopped. And I opened up a beautiful store. Oh, I forgot to tell you, before I left, my, my late father passed away <clears throat> and left me the wherewithal to do these things that I planned on doing. So I had Bernie's money and my money and the old man's money. <laughs> and by God, I was ready to track. No question about that. But it seems at this point, I... Uh, my my working is interfering with my drinking or my drinking was interfering with my working. I was selling invoices that hadn't been paid for and all of this stupid stuff that a drunk does, you know? And, uh, well, what happened? In 20 months, I was a bankrupt. And as soon as I went broke, I thought of my dear wife. <laughs> This is some two years after I left the court. And I knew this kid needed me. I must hurry home. <laughs> so after the bankruptcy was cleared, I had $60,000 of accounts receivables that I had managed to keep out of the court. And an old and dear friend says, Bill, I don't know what you're going to do with that paper. I, uh... He says, I'd take it off your hands for 10 cents on the dollar. I'd give me the money, Otto. Give me the money. And so I began my way back to New Jersey, where we were living at the time in Richfield Park. And, uh, it took me nine months to get back home. <laughs> I came the long way, but the way of San Diego, you know. <laughs> and I arrived back in a, a place charitably called Lincoln Park. I had this thin Oldsmobile. Seems I'd had a little discussion with a couple of greyhounds on the way home. <laughs> And I sold that for 50 bucks and promptly drank it up. I peddled everything else, the spare tire, took the radio out and all that before I peddled it. And I felt so sorry for old Bill. God, what have they done to this fine Irish Catholic boy? What have they done? Oh, I felt terrible. I called my residence. No, this phone has been disconnected. Oh, my God. Now what am I going to do? I'm reduced to a pair of well, what today you call jeans with very little fanny in them. An old faded blue shirt and an excellent pair of Stacy Adams shoes. And you know, I'm at Lincoln Park, I'll tell you a little bit about Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park is really, and this is true, is the southbound of a northbound horse, is what it is. <laughs> I discovered there's more bums there than anything else. And I'm sitting on this bench, and this is in November. 
colder than a well digger standing in the Klondike, wondering what's going to become of old Bill. When along comes another bum. Hi, kid. He said, hello. I, first guy spoken to me in three weeks. He says, say, that's a nice pair of shoes you're wearing there. I said, yes. He says, I know where we can get 75 cents for those shoes. Is that so? I said, yes. He said, well, let's go. <laughs> And we went down to a place on Market Street in Newark, New Jersey, to a place called Cheap Charles, aptly named. <laughs> in we go, and it's starting to snow. And he looked down at us and said, well, I said, I did it. Well, he says, take them off and let me look at them. I said, these were Stacy. I don't care who made the damn shoes. Take them off and I'll look at them. They go, well, he says, they're a little damp, but uh, all right, I'll go for it. And he gave me 75 cents and a pair of canvas relievers. Well, now, right next door to Cheap Charlie's, what do you think they were? What do you think was there? A gin mill. And what did they have on sale that day? Two bottles of muscatel that had never seen a grape for 75 cents. <laughs> right next door to the gin mill is a convenient alley. Me being the host, I ushered my new pond. <laughs> we uncorked the first jug. I handed it to him. He took a big drink, and he put his arms around me. And I took a big drink, and I put my arms around him. I want to tell you there's no love like one drunken bum for another. <laughs> Back to the park we go. He's telling me of his vast conquest in the field of chemistry. I was amazed at this story. In turn, I had to tell him about my chain of furniture stores. <laughs> you see, the first liar didn't have a chance. <laughs> and we're sitting there on this bench surrounded by all the snowflakes. And I was describing my newest venture. I... I designed a new front for the store. And I turned around for his approval, and the bum was gone. He took the full bottle with him. <laughs> this is not a nice man. <laughs> What's going to become of me? And I'm crying. Oh, I cried beautifully in those days. Still do. <laughs> when along comes another bum. Say, kid, he said, uh, let's you and I go down to see Sally. I, said, I don't know the lady. I have no money. And I'm cold. No, he says, I mean the Salvation Army. Well, now. He says, you know, they'll give us a flop. Is that so? Yes. Well, let's go. And down we go. And sure enough, the guy gave us a room. First of all, he sent us up there to take a shower. He said, I'll, I'll put you guys up tonight because I wouldn't let a dog stay out on a night like this. And he took us up to this dismal, cold shower. He gave us a piece of cloth that had never seen the soft soap process <laughs> and a bar of soap. As I looked through this fine group, I don't see anybody here old enough that remembers that old soap. <laughs> old yellow fells naphtha. Yes, well, I was wrong. You all look so young. Forgive me. <laughs> well, I scrubbed up very daintily, pranced out, and he ushered us into a room where there were 200 men sleeping on these World War I Helen Gould cots. 
He threw us a horse blanket apiece. He says, now get in there and build me up. Yes, sir, I said. I was free. He's going to throw us out. Well, I was at the point now to where I know I'm not going to live through the night. I know that. And I think I had just fallen asleep when a bell rings and the lights go on. Everybody up. This guy just standing up at the front. I looked at his cap that said Envoy on it. Now he says, You two new guys, you want to work? Well, I said, I, I'm really not a well man, Envoy. I, uh... Well, then get out. Oh, I took the rope and I went over and looked out the window. The snow was hip deep to a tall Indian out there. I hastily reconsidered. I said, but I don't have any shoes. I only have these, these uh, mules, these relievers. So they got me a pair of, of shoes. I wore eight and a half then. They got me a pair of tens. You put paper in the toes. And they ushered me into a room about this size. It's called the Bailey Room. And in the middle of this room stands this huge steel press. Surrounded by acres and acres and acres of newsprint. I never saw so darn much paper in my whole life. Now he says, you don't have to have a college degree to operate this thing either, Green. <laughs> oh no, I didn't. You have to fold the paper and straighten it up and put it in. And when it's full, you call... Well, we say Gus. You call Gus over there, and he'll attach the wires to it, and you begin all over again. Well, let me tell you something about the old alcoholic. When he starts to sober up, he works at it harder than anybody. By God, I bailed more paper there on Pennington Street than has ever been bailed before or since. And right away, I'm looking for a promotion. <laughs> I said to the envoy, I said, envoy, don't you have a, a better job for a bright boy like me? <laughs> well, this is Friday, and uh, they pay you 95 cents a week your first week. Nowadays, my God, you get $15, $20 a week. Of course, it doesn't buy any more than the 95 cents it did then. But, uh, so they made me a helper on the truck. And we went out into the oranges. All that week as my adventure out there continues, I'm running in and out of the yard and bringing out stuff, clothes and shoes and paper. I'm looking at the guy driving this rig. I say, now he's got it made. One of the boys brought out a nice coat with a velvet collar. These are in the years when spats were in vogue. You wore spats with your velvet Chesterfield and a bowler hat. And uh, so I went to him and he said, you show up Monday morning. So Monday morning I'm right there. And then I'm out there in the oranges and I'm running in and out of the yard bringing out the stuff that the driver would say, I'll take that right up here, son. Oh, that's the way the game was played. <clears throat> Get a nice pair of shoes, I'll take those up here. So the driver was the guiding genius of the safari. <laughs> so I worked hard that week. Friday night, I got my three bucks. I buddied up to the driver. I took him out and got him drunk. Monday, I got his job. <laughs> Such is the progression of alcoholism. How far is low? What is the bottom of the barrel? I became a penny bum. 
I learned to like peraldehyde better than booze. I made the rounds of the city hospitals. The late Dr. Altman, God rest his soul, said to me, Bill, if I see you up here one more Saturday night like this, I'm going to call the cops. Well, I, that kind of broke up my routine. I ended up in the Jersey City Medical Center under what they charitably called restraining sheets. That's a fancy name for a straitjacket, you know. And somehow they had found my wife. I don't know how. You'll have to give next to kin before you could get in there. The Jersey City Medical Center was just open there. And they found my wife and they asked her would she come down. I think she came down to identify the body. <laughs> she was surprised to see me. Ah, Ma, I, I've been a bad boy. Oh, my God, she said, how, how could you dare me? How did you get... Oh, I don't even want to talk about it. And the floor man there in his white ducks and his white shirt says, why don't you let him try AA? She said, would you try AA, Bill? This is November 1939. And I said, oh, yes, get me out of here. This is big. <laughs> This big guy is mean to me. Oh, I, I couldn't punch my way out of a paper bag. But you know, you girls have lots of compassion. You just, just love we alcoholics. That's all there is to it. Indeed, it's true. And she took me home. Home. She took me to a little basement apartment on High Street. It was 40 bucks a month. She had taken a job as a waitress. She was a gently bred girl. She had no skill. And it's an honorable profession. And she took me into this little apartment. And she bought me a $15 suit. She said, will you go to the... The meeting, the meeting was on Wednesday night in the old Helen McHugh Studios on West Washington Street. And at that time, in AA, there were three meetings. There was 24th Street Clubhouse, there was the South Orange Field House, and the Helen McHugh Studios. I said, oh, yes, yes, I'll go. She says, I think I'll go with you. <laughs> No, I said, don't. They don't have any women there. I mean, I, let me sample it and uh, see what it's all about. So I got into this $15 suit. She stuck a buck in my pocket. Now, don't drink, Bill. I said, would I drink? <laughs> That's why there's more horses' asses than there are horses. <laughs> So I said, no, and I'll come right home. So I went down to the meeting. Three flights of stairs in that old rickety building that has since been torn down. It's a parking lot now. Huh? And I got up those stairs, and I'm fingering this buck. But I am not really recovered yet, you know, from my session in uh, the medical center. My guts are raw. I got up there and I opened the door and there's some fella up there talking behind a lectern just like this one and he's talking about the grace of God. Oh. 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 I said, excuse me. And I tiptoed downstairs fingering the butt. And as I got downstairs, I'm so weak from walking up and down, I said, I better get home. So I did. I went right home. 
still have the blood. My wife let me in. I kissed her. She says, how was the meeting, Dad? And I said, oh, wonderful, dear. Let me tell you about it. See, on the way home, I cooked up a little story because uh, I knew if I told her the thing was a bust out, and I, uh, it wouldn't go over. So I concocted this fanciful tale. I said, yes, the meeting was wonderful, dear. I said, you know, right next to the speaker's lectern, they had a little table. She says, what's that for? I said, be quiet, and I'll tell you. I said, and on the table, they had a bowl of cracked ice. And they had a bottle of white rock. And they had a bottle of rye. And some gin, too. She said, what's that for? Oh, I said, they just put that there to test you. <laughs> See, already I'm figuring out how I can drink a little bit without getting caught. <laughs> she said, you didn't drink? Uh, well, of course not, noble creature that I am. Next Wednesday rolls around, and with her chicken soup, I'm feeling pretty good. She gave me another buck. Now I got two. Oh, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm fully recovered now. <laughs> Right down to Max Longbar. Hello, boys. Bombing. A little, a little Canadian club in playing more. I said, you know, uh, Overholt's a little strong for me now. Yeah, he said, I know. We discussed the war in Europe, Hitler's invasion of Poland. I settled that in less than ten minutes. <laughs> And I looked up at the clock, and I'd been gone, oh, I guess almost an hour. I, Jeez, I've got to get the hell out of here and get home. So I got back to the apartment, and I rapped on the door. She let me in. She says, I smell booze, Bill. I said, the trouble with you, Wilma, is you don't listen to me. Do you remember the little table? She says, yes. I, and I said, I've just been testing, that's all. I don't have to tell you I slept on the sidewalk that night either, do I? <laughs> now, I'd like to take a little time to tell you a little bit about the romance of recovery in AA. Time passes rapidly, as we all know. The war is on. They wouldn't take me. They didn't care for me. I was 42 years old, and uh, they could do better than that. But I finally got into the Merchant Marine, and I made six trips on this old tub, the old Finland of the IMM, the National Mercantile Marine. I made three to Murmansk and three to Vladivostok. We never got off the tub at any one time until we got back to New York or Hoboken. And every trip we'd get a $500 bonus. Oh, I like that part. Oh, my. And finally the war is over. And I'd been stumbling around, wondering what the hell was going to become of me. I'd wormed my way back into the house again. And in telling you about the recovery part of AA, I think it's one of the most exciting things that I have to tell you. Because this is a chance to be born again. This is a chance to get well. I'm lying on the floor of our living room rug, and uh, I'm having a small hemorrhage. I'm bleeding from the nose and from the mouth and from the eyes. And I said, you know, Ma, I'd like to try AA again. Oh, she says, you mean that crap with the table? <laughs> 
no, I said, but this time I'll take you. Well, she says, you're in no condition. I said, get Dr. Lubin. The romance of recovery. Dr. Lubin, everybody has a Dr. Lubin in their life. This particular Dr. Lubin is a mealy-mouthed, slimy individual with horrible breath, bad teeth. He just had an onion sandwich. (laughs) But for five dollars, he could perform miracles. And uh, as he'd been to our apartment several times in the past, he came in and he said to me, Oh, I see he's done it again, huh? <laughs> All right, you got the five? Nothing happens without the five, you know. And he has a needle, the point on it was like the blunt end of our gavels that we have at our meeting. And he pushed around and he found a little flesh and he shot this thing into me. I flew up off the floor. Oh, thank you, doctor. My wife unpacked my clothes that were in the closet. They had a lock on the closet because we were in a basement apartment. We were right on the basement floor. And uh, she washed me off and and, uh, she said, I wouldn't attempt to shave you. I had about a month or so to grow up the beard. And we went across the street to the drugstore. She put a nickel in the box. She dialed AA. And this is what happened. AA, Louis speaking. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Louis, I, why, I said, I'm BG. Well, he says, isn't that dead? <laughs> <laughs> no. He says, are you a married fellow? I said, yes. My wife is right here, as if she, he could see through the telephone. He's right here. Uh, he said, uh, you got a car? Oh, good Lord, no. Well, he says, we're having a meeting tonight at the old Roseville Athletic Club. Can you come up? Bring your wife with you. Yes. Up we go. We get on the 46 bus and up we went. I'd been thrown out of there many times. I knew exactly where it was. <laughs> And we walked up those old 13 steps of a brownstone mausoleum. And standing at the door is a man as big as my friend George here, smoking a pipe. The most rancid, evil-smelling thing I have ever smelled in my entire life. He takes it out and says, Hiya, boy. My name is Charlie. Yes, I I want you to meet Joe. Joe was a fellow who came down like our friend. Some of us were from Jerry. And uh, Joe says, what's your name, boy? I I said, Bill Green. I said, that's all right. You can tell me your name. I said, that is my name. <laughs> the ladies of al had swept my bride up in their arms and taken her off into a little room to tell her the facts of life. <laughs> their version, not mine. <laughs> Charlie and Joe ushered me into this little office, and here sits a poor, anemic little man. I said, you're, you're Louie? He says, yes. I said, by God, you need a drink. Oh, that was, that was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, he says, you're not funny. You're one of these smart asses, aren't you? Huh? <laughs> no, no. I said, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Louie. I, I, what do you wear that beard for? Well, I said, I don't wear a beard. I just haven't been able to shave. I say, just take him in and give him some coffee. In we go to this big long bar there. What's his name? Al sells beer. <laughs> I figured it. I'm Bill Bradley. What's he do? Oh, yes. Meet Frank. Hello, Frank. How are you? Yeah, you'll be all right, Bill. Yeah. The coffee of those years was gasoline. <laughs> it is now January the 4th, 1946. And I'm sitting there. Fellas, I'd like to tell you a little bit about... Shut up! <laughs> Drink the coffee. The coffee of 1946 was kerosene, what it was. <laughs> because they re it and rehashed it and ran it through and it was just brown water. All of a sudden the bell rings. I think the joint's on fire. <laughs> I jump up off the seat, my wife. Well, oh, shut up. Well, what was it? A meeting is going to start up there, and you're going. Oh, yeah. Joe on one side and Charlie on the other. You know, I thought at the time, the way those guys hung on to me, I must have been the only schnook they had in there in a year. <laughs> we got upstairs. The lady sat on one side, fellows on the other, and I discovered later on the reason they did that was to keep us from killing each other. <laughs> <laughs> we sat right down in row A, where Johnny and, and his lady are. Charlie's there, old dad is here. Joe's on the other side. I said, Joe, do you have a cigarette? He says, I don't smoke. Oh, my God. 6,000 people worldwide in the movement, and I'm sitting between the only two stiffs that don't use cigarettes. <laughs> the romance of recovery. <laughs> I said, oh, no. relax, kid. <laughs> they called on the first speaker. This guy talked for an hour. Good thing I was allotted two hours tonight. The next meeting's going to be a little late. <laughs> He took us all the way back to the Boer War, for God's sake. <laughs> I turned to Joe, I said, would you tell me what in heaven's name this has got to do with me? <laughs> he says, B.G., if you don't shut up and sit still, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. God. He took us all the way up to the White Cliffs of Dover, back into the African camp. <laughs> I looked down on the floor, and there on the floor was a big, big cigarette butt. I very casually got my toe out there. <laughs> I pulled it in with arm's reach, and I bent down to pick it up. Charlie stepped on my hand. Because we don't do those kind of things in here, Bill. Oh, no. Oh, I... Then they called on the second speaker. A tiny little man who was married to a tiny little girl with three tiny little children. <laughs> and this guy told the most poignant story I've ever heard in my entire lifetime. Seems it was Thanksgiving, as his story goes. Thanksgiving dinner was simmering on the rear of this new 
range, electric range that he bought for his wife. Three of his cronies went around the front. One of them rang the doorbell. And they ran around the back and took stove, dinner and all, right out the back door. <laughs> I like that guy. <laughs> I looked over at my wife and said, I never did anything like that. We never had a stove that was worth a day. <laughs> They passed the basket. I have nothing that remotely resembles money. And as the basket went by, I looked. <laughs> Pretty good cake tonight. <laughs> then they called on what God sent to be the last speaker. An old and dear friend by the name of Stoney. Stoney had a penchant for wearing diamonds unlike no other man in this movement, including the late Tom Mahan. He had a diamond horseshoe pin, pinned on the front of his shirt, no tie. He had a Ronson cigarette lighter that he kept flipping. And it had five one-carat stones embedded in the side. And he was looking right at me. <laughs> he says, if you're sick and don't have a job tonight, don't you let it bother you. <laughs> if I'd have had a gun, I'd have shot him right between the eyes. <laughs> romance of recovery and <laughs> Finally the meeting is over. I take me downstairs. They took me downstairs. I threw up what I thought was five gallons of coffee across the bus. <laughs> Come on back up. I want to meet the speaker. Oh, it was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Oh, honey. oh, God in heaven, get me out of here. Would you care for a tuna fish sandwich, Mr. Green? <laughs> A more horrible thought no one could thought of. <laughs> horrible. Tom says, don't worry, kid. You get a rope, you put a knot in it and hang on. He went out the door and got in his Cadillac and went that way. <laughs> Stoney said, boy. You won't have any problems. He blew on his four-carat stone. Said, just hang in there. And he went out and got into another Cadillac and went the other way. <laughs> and Carol Fairbanks says, these are all deceased people of which I speak. Carol Fairbanks says, don't let him smoke. Forms gas out of his stomach. <laughs> Do you remember that, Bill? Uh, yeah, I remember it. I'd like to punch you. In the <laughs> we went out and got on the bus and went the other way. <laughs> Buy him the book, make him read it tonight. We went back to our little apartment on High Street, and I started to take off my jacket. And my lady says, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm going to get undressed in my." You're going to do no such thing. You're going to do just what the girls told me to have you do. <laughs> oh, you're going to sit in the chair and read the book. I'm going to make a nice pot of coffee. <laughs> Romance of recovery. <laughs> Monday night, here they come. Tuesday night, here they come. Wednesday, I, don't you fellas have a job? <laughs> Shut up. Don't utter another peep or I'm going to punch you right in the nose. 
And Charlie had a hand on him as big as a hand, and he could do it too. Ten days passed. I recognized food the first time for what it really is. See, I was one of those drunks that never ate when I drank. First of all, that cost money, and when I was alone, I, I didn't have any money. So, yes, I, I can't. I'm, I'm thinking about about these horrible times, and and uh, I. Uh, I got out into space here, and I'm having a little problem flying back, but I'll rejoin you in a minute. (laughs) After the 10 days, and I asked the guys about their working, then I remember that we were permitted to go to a meeting unassisted. Oh, what a relief to get away. I said to Charlie, if I ever get a job, I'll buy you a pipe. No, you don't have to, Bill. Well, three months pass. Oh, I'm dry as dust. And just as useless. <laughs> the only thing I had done is put my behind on those hard chairs, which in those years were those old slatted collapsible chairs, and uh, was very, very miserable. So Charlie said to me, Bill, why don't you form a group down there in Clinton Hill? God, you got a big mouth. <laughs> so we formed the Clinton Hill group. And at our first meeting, there were seven. And then two of them went out and got drunk. <laughs> and the next meeting, we had two new members. And then four of them went out and got drunk. <clears throat> so in my 90-day period, they give us these little pins that I'm wearing. Not this particular one, because the diamond was put in there after I'd been in AA some 10 years. And uh, <clears throat> these guys said, Bill, would you say a few words? Oh, I had a carefully prepared text in my pocket. <laughs> Some 2,000 words. (laughs) And I got up there in front of those 12, 15 people, and I I said, I got got you. (coughs) I'm an alcoholic, I said. And I sat down. And the applause was tremendous. I have since found out it's because I was so brief. (laughs) I see by my watch that it won't happen to me tonight. (laughs) So, we formed that little group, and by golly, it grew. And it grew. And it grew. And then we had to split off. And in that time, I had gotten a job working for a guy that had one time worked for me. And uh, he gave me an offering that I couldn't refuse. And I was enjoying my life. And I was down on Mulberry Street every night after I came from work. You want to go to AA? What's that? (laughs) You want to get off the street? Ah, come on. Yes. I said, I'm back with my wife. Come home. She'll feed you, but you got to go to an AA meeting with me. Oh, man, was I ever overzealous. (laughs) I'd bring these bums home, and they had to take a bath, 
And I had you, I'd gotten clothes from the Volunteers of America and the Salvation Army. And uh, straightened them up. But they only straightened up for that one day, just in order to go to the meeting. No, no. Just in order to get fed and have a place to sleep that night. That was the, the, the crux of their desire. So, out of the first hundred guys I worked with, I had one recovery. An old Scotsman with the name of Jimmy Frazier. He was 70 years old when he came into AA, and he'd been on the bum for 10 years. Boxcar Jimmy fine old Scotsman, and he lived nine years in AA as a sober, working alcoholic, which is wonderful. You see, in my recovery, I'd forgotten about God. I'd forgotten about the efficacy of prayer, higher powers was something that uh, the other guy worked with. And I want to tell you something. I awoke this one morning, still in the little basement apartment, after five years in AA. We didn't have enough money to do anything with because I'm so busy bringing drunks home. And I think that my wife was just about at the end of her rope. And I don't blame her now. And this morning I awoke. And our bedroom window looked right out into the street. And you know what I saw that morning? A little three-foot stunted oak with one branch that protruded at right angles. And on that branch, there was sitting a little bird, one of the tiniest of God's feathered creatures, a city sparrow. You know what he was doing? He's taking a bath. I've never seen a bird take a bath before. I'd spent 25 years in the bottom of a brown bottle. an awareness of God. I too learned to pray. <clears throat> Little prayers at first. Thanks God for a lovely day. My wife went to the priest of our parish she said, Father John, I don't know what I'm going to ever do with Bill. She said, he's not drinking again, is he? She says, no, but he doesn't want to go to the Mass anymore. Well, I don't know what to tell you, my child. She says, I'd like to talk to the bishop. This is John McNulty, who was the dean of Seton Hall College at that time. And his brother was Bishop McNulty. And she got an audience with the bishop. She told him about my bringing all these drunks home. She said, Eminence, I don't know what I'm going to do with Bill. He's driving me crazy. I'm on my feet ten hours a day, slinging hash in the dump to provide a place for us to live. Yes, he got a job, all right. But the money he gets, he spends it on these drunks. He bought one guy a car for $600. And where did he go? Off into the wilderness someplace. And it was 30 years later that I saw him in California at the Woodland Hills Group. And I said, Ralphie, boy, <laughs> he looked at me. Bill Green? Uh, yes. 
<laughs> he had a chain of appliance stores. And I reminded him, oh no, he says, you don't have to remind me. He says, I, uh, I know about your, your worried about that $600 and I've been meaning to send it to you. <laughs> The Romance of Recovery. <laughs> so we went down to the post office the next day, and he made out a postal money order for $600 and sent it to GSR in New York. And every Christmas I used to get a Christmas card from him. This is back in 1970. So you see, AA does work. The power of prayer is with all of us. You either believe or you don't believe. I like to tell the story of the locust. For those of you that have been to the tabernacle in Salt Lake City, you'll see in a glass case the locust and the seagull. Let me tell you a little bit about this story. It seems that they had a terrific famine there. And Brother Smith, who was the head of the Mormons, he told them to pray, brother, pray. And the, and the locusts were eating all their crops. And they all prayed. And what do you think happened? 800 miles from their natural habitat, the Pacific Ocean, in came this multitude of seagulls. And they proceeded to devour the locusts and fly back to the sea and disgorge them in the sea. And they continued until all the locusts were gone and the crops were saved. The Romance of Recovery in AA. Now, if you can either believe or you don't believe, but in the glass case is one of the, lo one of the locusts and one of the seagulls. And you sign the register to show that you've been there. A wonderful experience, a very moving experience the efficacy of prayer. And then I got on the Chautauqua circuit. I'd been, I'd been sober, oh, I guess, seven, eight years. And they asked me to speak in foreign lands. Canada, Australia, London, Paris, all because of AA. Isn't that wonderful? And you folks have asked me to come here tonight and speak to you here. At Christmas time, we used to get hundreds and hundreds of cards every Christmas, some of them from people I didn't even know. Wasn't that a wonderful thing? Not because of Bill Green, but because of AA. This is the only way that I know of. I've tried everything else. Needles, Lubin's potion. The McTaggart system put it in his coffee. He'll never know. <laughs> the hell he won't. <laughs> And then one day, you're privileged to tell the story of AA to somebody that needs it very badly. And you bring him to a meeting, and you nurse him along, and you watch him grow big and strong like a tree. don't have to worry about God then. He's sitting right in front of your eyes. Try it sometime. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.